Hey there, it's Rob Arnfield speaking to you from Western University. Today we're going to talk about how to do a stroke volume determination on your patient right at their bedside. Stroke volume determination is not necessary to do point of care echo and is actually, I would say, infrequently indicated. We can agree that the eyeball method of LV function determination is quite good. Most of us use it to guide our patients through their shock state and the literature would support that we are accurate at this and uh, evolving literature would suggest there may even be a mortality benefit for using this tool in patients admitted to the ICU with shock. Occasionally, however, you may wish to get under the hood a little bit deeper. You may wish to have a quantitative look at things and when that is indicated or you feel it's indicated, then a stroke volume determination is the place to go. There's a few advantages of this approach. Sometimes ejection fraction may be overestimating a patient's cardiac output uh, and be discordant with their actual stroke volume. The classic examples I see are right heart failure where you have an empty left ventricle that has a very high ejection fraction correspondingly and the right ventricle is obstructed. These cases are hard to manage and tracking the actual quantity of blood leaving the left ventricle can help give you feedback about your right heart management. More simply, however, hypovolemic shock is a great example where the EF might be reassuring, such as being 80 or 90% even in some examples, such as the one shown here at the uh, bottom of the screen, where you can see the ventricle is ejecting nearly all the blood, but we know that that amount of blood and that stroke volume is actually not terribly compatible with life, and sometimes having a quantitative measure can help resolve these circumstances that are more subtle, as we'll see at the end of this screencast. In addition to monitoring interventions more quantitatively, the other advantage is that you'll, I think, generally become a more capable sonographer if you can employ these techniques and have a better appreciation of hemodynamics. So two additional good reasons to learn this technique. So stroke volume, I hope we can all agree, is a discrete column or cylinder of blood that is ejected from the left ventricular outflow tract during systole. Taking this quite literally, we will place a cylinder here in the LVOT and imagine that that is your actual systolic event occurring. This is important because what going forward you need to think of this cylinder and to think about its volume and this will guide us down the path of how to determine its, the stroke volume in each systolic event. Now, to solve for a volume, in this case, you need the radius of our cylinder and we need the height of our cylinder. Now, this is getting a little mathy, but trust me, it's not terribly hard. Let's have a look. So first, we're going to start with the radius uh, of our column, which is going to be half the width of our left ventricular outflow tract, the very passageway where the uh, column is passing. So a parasternal long axis view provides excellent resolution of this area. A zoom in on the area as is done here. And then using the cine feature of your machine, scrolling back and forth to so happy you have a image where the aortic valve leaflets are open and that represents mid systole. And using your calipers, you can determine the width or diameter. And of course a diameter is going to be double the radius, or a radius is half the diameter. And so in this case, we get a diameter of 2.11. So 2.11 plotted into a formula, as you see here, produces the area of the base of our cylinder, 3.49 centimeters squared. Don't worry, this will get easier and is not this labor intensive when you actually do this at the bedside, but to understand it now is very important. Next, we need to solve for the height of our cylinder or column. You'll recall the height and the area of the base, which we've just solved, is what's required to determine the volume of our cylinder. The height of the column will be gleaned from a spectral Doppler display. Spectral Doppler is the graphical display of velocity and time. It's really just the more graphical representation of what we're accustomed to with color Doppler. So within spectral Doppler, there's a few different modes. We want to ensure we're on pulse wave or PW mode, which will give us this nice equal sign looking apparatus, which has to be placed in the LVOT. How do you get the LVOT in a parallel alignment? Well, that generally comes from your apical five chamber view. Some of you who may be generating apical three chamber views uh, may be able to have a good view as well, but most of us will choose the apical five. Once you then engage the Doppler sig uh, signal at that site, you'll reliably get a systolic event represented by a nice flow envelope 
corresponding to one third of the cardiac cycle. Of course, the other two thirds are going to be a diastolic event. Some people will choose to do this with an EKG tracer. Many of us at the point of care recognize that is less practical. So once you have this column of blood, we'll show you what you're going to do. So we'll take you through the whole scenario here. So an apical five chamber view, you see the aortic valve uh, in view there. Initially, we have the CW with this diamond. We don't want that, we want PW. And we place that as parallel as possible in the LVOT. Once we're happy that we're not abutting onto the aortic valve leaflet themselves and we're in the LVOT, we'll engage the Doppler function. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. We'll make a couple adjustments with the baseline and with the scale to make the envelopes as clear as possible. Once you're satisfied you have a nice and easy traceable envelope to work with, you'll engage your finger painting skills to trace around this, obtaining the integral of this envelope, and that is going to be a number known as the VTI or velocity time integral. And that effectively is going to be our height of our column. And the height of our column ends up being 13.2 centimeters. So we plug that into our formula. We recall that area times height is going to be volume, and we see that the stroke volume is 46 cc's. Our patient happens to have a heart rate of 85. Easy math then tells us that this patient in shock has a cardiac output of 3.9 liters per minute. And if this is a 20 kilogram infant, perhaps that's sufficient to meet someone with hypermetabolic needs, but we can agree that that is insufficient cardiac output for someone who uh, needs enriched oxygen delivery. So there's an example of how you do it the long way. Let's look at it again uh, in a different case. It's a ca recent case that I was exposed to uh, regarding a patient with pneumosepsis in the ICU uh, on norepinephrine for shock, vasodilatory shock. The question, of course, was uh, can we alter the management at all? You can appreciate on this peristernal short axis, just slow down a little bit at the papillary muscle level. Contraction appears to be preserved, and we would generally agree this is normal LV function. We go a bit deeper, however, we measure the LVOT diameter in the peristernal long axis. We get that to be 2.15 centimeters, which going through the math gives us an area of 3.63. We then find a pretty dubious apical five chamber, but just to be sure we're going to get a good Doppler signal, we throw some color Doppler on. And because we have a reliable blue jet here, I'm satisfied that the Doppler information there is preserved and we can pulse that area to get a a decent envelope that captures the height of our cylinder, and our height of our cylinder here is 13.4. We run the math again, of course, and we find that our stroke volume is nearly 49 cc's at a relatively low heart rate. We have a cardiac output of 3.6 liters per minute. Again, a pretty lousy cardiac output despite preserved ventricular function. So the question is, what do you do? Well, we don't necessarily want to increase the inotropy of our heart. But going back to other adjuncts like a lung ultrasound, we determined the patient had dry lungs. And the IVC, because the patient was triggering on positive pressure, was indeterminate. We opted to engage with more volume. And we found that simple volume challenge was able to increase our VTI and increase our cardiac output and earn us a improved physiologic state. And we now offer vasopressors for this patient. So once again, we can agree that ejection fraction or left ventricular function, and this, as is shown in this case, doesn't really equate with actual stroke volume. And before you say, well, this is all nice and good, and but I'm never going to do the math, most machines, and including the sonocyte machine depicted in this tutorial, uh, will do the math for you uh, using a cardiac output setting. So if you punch in the diameter and the heart rate and uh, measure the VTI, it'll spit out all the numbers for you down there. Uh, which is quite handy. Lastly, some shortcuts that uh, I tend to use a fair bit regarding cardiac output determination. The LVOT diameter is invariable. So once you've determined this in a patient, if you want to do serial measurements, you don't generally have to go back and measure again. And with that in mind, changes in VTI will therefore represent changes in stroke volume. So if you want to go back and do serial measurements with any patient pre and post intervention, just go back to the apical five chamber, do the VTI, and then therefore changes in VTI will represent your changes in stroke volume. Similarly, tracing the entire VTI is not necessary in that same scenario, and you can just use the peak velocity to gauge whether or not you've had a change in VTI. And if you really are in a hurry, then use the normal VTI range of 18 to 20 centimeters, which with a typical LVOT size will correspond to a normal stroke volume. So 
so rapidly if you just want to grab the VTI and it falls into the 10 to 14 range you know you're dealing with an impaired stroke volume so that's it thanks for listening i hope this was informative for you follow us on westernsano.ca or at westernsano talk to you later